At a time when 41% of Earth's land has already been swallowed by expanding deserts, China has suddenly become the center of one of the boldest ecological comebacks of the century. And the solution isn't high-tech, nor is it a miracle. It's 200 million willow trees and 1.2 million rabbits. These harmless-looking rabbits carry a strange, natural mechanism, powerful enough to change the fate of an entire landscape. Behind this seemingly crazy idea is a man once known as the Madman of the Desert, someone who believed that with the right ecological loop, even dead land can be brought back to life. And the place he chose for his experiment was Kabuki, a region that used to have villages and green grasslands before fierce winds stripped away the topsoil and turned it into a 7 down on 200 square mile sea of dead sand. So how could willow trees and rabbits reverse a disaster that science itself once considered hopeless? This story is one you won't be able to look away from. Today, Kabuki is considered one of the harshest regions in all of China, a place where winters cut like a knife, dropping to minus 20 degrees Celsius, and summers get so hot they can scorch the ground. But this extreme climate is really just the surface of a much bigger disaster. Desertification. According to a 2025 report, about 27.4% of China's land has already suffered severe degradation, an area nearly four times the size of Texas. Once vegetation disappeared due to overgrazing, deforestation, and exhausted farmland, the topsoil lost its anchor. Rising temperatures dried the surface even more. Strong winds then easily swept everything away, causing China to lose nearly 20 million tons of crops to the sea of sand every year. In just a few decades, sand dunes as tall as 60 meters pushed more than 40 kilometers eastward burying thousands of acres of farmland and turning what was once a thriving region into one of the country's largest expanding deserts. Faced with the rapid spread of desertification, China launched large-scale campaigns as early as the 1950s and 1960s. They planted long belts of windbreak forests, restricted grazing, and drilled countless deep wells through layers of dry, loose soil in search of groundwater. But despite enormous effort and investment, the results were barely noticeable. The desert kept pushing south and northwest, threatening the livelihoods of more than 400 million people living in semi-arid regions. In the middle of that deadlock, a turning point came from the last place anyone expected. An ordinary man named Wang Wenbao, later known as the Desert King. Wang didn't come from money. He was a poor school teacher in Inner Mongolia, biking more than 10 kilometers every day across sand-covered roads just to get to school. Some mornings, the wind was so strong that half his bicycle would be buried in sand, and waves of sand sharp as blades would lash his face and fill his lungs. In that harsh environment, Wong made himself a bold promise. If I can't escape the desert, then the desert will have to support me. No one imagined that this single sentence would become the starting point of a journey that changed an entire landscape. At the beginning of this journey, Wang Wenbao had almost nothing besides a small salt business and a determination that pushed against every limit. Yet he chose a path no one else dared to take. He emptied his entire savings, even borrowed money from friends and banks, all to chase a goal that sounded unbelievable. Turning dry, lifeless sand into soil that could sustain life again. Many called him insane. Even the local authorities saw Wang as a dreamer, willingly throwing himself into the desert. But instead of backing down, Wong did the exact opposite. He moved straight into the heart of the dunes, facing the scorching winds and endless sand head on. Every day, he carefully recorded the faintest traces of moisture left in the soil, watching how each gust of wind carved the terrain. As if he were trying to decipher a secret language the desert had been hiding for centuries. Step by step, he began tackling tasks that seemed impossible building long stretches of windbreak walls, planting more than 60 million willow trees to anchor the land, and gradually restoring 1,300 square kilometers of barren terrain, all funded by hundreds of millions of dollars he somehow managed to assemble. But the real turning point only came when Wong conceived an idea no one had ever dared to imagine, bringing rabbits into the desert to create an entirely new ecological loop. When the idea of using rabbits to revive the desert first began to take shape, 
Wong understood one thing clearly. For the rabbits to survive, he first needed a plant strong enough to stand its ground against scorching winds and shifting sand. Out of dozens of options, only one species met every harsh requirement. The willow. Willows became the foundation of the entire ecosystem because their roots can reach nearly 90 meters deep, tapping into water layers that most plants can't reach. Once those roots take hold, they stabilize the sand, weaken the force of the wind, and create a cooler microclimate stable enough for life to begin. That's why the willow wasn't just another plant. It was the starting switch for the entire ecological loop. To turn willows into the backbone of the ecosystem, Wong had to face a challenge that had gone unsolved for centuries. How do you keep a tree alive in a place where the ground gets hot enough to scorch insects in minutes? In Kubuki, the wind doesn't just blow, it carries sand like razor blades, capable of stripping bark and ripping out roots in just a few days. On top of that, surface temperatures above 70 degrees Celsius make germination almost impossible. That's why planting a willow here isn't as simple as dig a hole and drop in a tree. It's a constant battle with nature. Planting teams have to track faint pockets of moisture hidden beneath the sand, the last lifelines of the land. When they find a spot that can hold water, they dig deep pits and immediately shield them with wire mesh, reeds, and temporary barriers to protect them from the next strong gust of wind. The young willows are treated with special moisture-retaining solutions and anchored with wooden frames so they won't be ripped out overnight. Water has to be used sparingly. Drip irrigation delivers only enough for the roots to sense life and push themselves deeper into the soil, clinging to the earth, clinging to their only chance of survival in this harsh sea of sand. Once the first bands of willow trees grew large enough to cast shade and retain moisture in the soil, Wong introduced the most important link in his restoration model, bringing Rex rabbits into a closed, controlled ecosystem. These rabbits were never released into the wild. They were raised in tightly managed ecological farms, where each one had both economic and ecological value. Their meat became a clean food source, their fur was used in high-end fashion products, and their organs supported traditional medicine. But what truly turned the Rex rabbit into an ecological weapon was its droppings. Rabbit manure is extremely rich in nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, nutrients the desert lacks entirely. When released into the environment, it doesn't just fertilize the soil, it helps loose sand bind together into a moist, nutrient-rich layer of humus. Even more interesting, Rex rabbits cannot digest grass seeds, so every time they dig or forage, Intact seeds end up mixed in their droppings and get scattered across the land, each one wrapped in a natural fertilizer pouch that allows it to sprout even under brutal desert conditions. As a result, new vegetation keeps appearing on its own, expanding the green coverage with minimal human intervention. Thanks to the arrival of the Rex rabbits, the structure of the new ecosystem gradually became clear and began operating like a self-balancing machine. The willow canopies provided shade and a steady source of food for the rabbits. The rabbits, in return, gave the land what it lacked most, nutrient-rich humus. This new soil held moisture, reduced erosion, and became the foundation for even stronger willow growth. This closed loop turned every hectare of sand into a natural humus-producing factory, generating more than five tons a year. Enough for a once barren, rock-hard stretch of desert to transform into fertile farmland in just three to five years. When the model scaled up, more than 200 million willow trees formed a massive green barrier, cutting wind speeds by up to 90% and preventing over 15 million tons of sand from shifting each year. Areas that were once helpless against sandstorms have now been restored with greenery across 700 to 800 square miles, creating a solid foundation for expanding the Rex rabbit farming model. As the ecosystem stabilized, the population of 1.2 million Rex rabbits not only helped regenerate the soil, but also became an economic spearhead, generating over 100 million yuan each year and providing thousands of families with a sustainable source of income in a place once considered uninhabitable. After the willow and rabbit ecological model proved successful, Wang Wenbao pushed his vision even further with a bolder step. 
combining land restoration with renewable energy. That's how the Junma Solar Power Plant was born. A project that wasn't just economically meaningful, but also became a symbol of how humans can rebuild a desert. On land once too hot to walk on barefoot, 196,000 solar panels were arranged in the shape of a galloping horse, creating the world's largest energy mural, officially recognized by Guinness. Each year, Yunma generates 1 to 1.5 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, enough to power more than 200,000 nearby residents. But what makes the project truly special isn't just its output. The solar panels, spread across thousands of acres, cast a vast shadow that cuts wind speeds by up to 50%, retains surface moisture, and creates ideal conditions for grasslands to naturally recover. Once the grass returned, Wong used rabbits, sheep, and geese as biological lawnmowers, keeping vegetation under control while continuing to stabilize the soil. Between 2010 and 2020, this eco-economic model generated 10 billion US dollars, turning Kabushi into the most profitable green development project in Asia. By 2022, Junma had saved 760,000 tons of coal, reduced CO2 emissions by 1.85 million tons, and restored more than 2,600 acres of land in just four years, a pace of recovery few ever believed was possible. Kubuki's recovery isn't just something you can see as green patches returning on a map. It's backed by hard data that has genuinely surprised scientists. According to China's Ministry of Ecology, populations of wild deer, desert foxes, and migratory birds have increased fourfold compared to 1990, a rise never recorded in any other semi-arid region of the country. Species once believed to have vanished from Kubuki are now reappearing, almost as if the entire ecosystem is rewriting its own story of survival. One of the most striking indicators of this comeback is the groundwater. Over the last two decades, water levels have risen by 1.5 to 2 meters, enough to completely change daily life for local residents. In the past, households had to drill extremely deep wells just to reach water. Today, they only need to drill about half as deep, cutting both costs and risks for the community. At the same time, native vegetation has surged back with remarkable strength. More than 100 plant species, from soft feather grass to resilient desert poplars to bright wildflowers, have returned across the landscape. Green bands now weave through the golden dunes, creating scenes that once seemed unimaginable. Small pockets of newly formed forest shimmering under the sunlight, growing right on land that was long believed to be nothing more than a dead sea of sand. Although Kubuki's achievements are undeniably impressive, the model has also sparked considerable debate among experts. Some specialists argue that the role of the Rex rabbits has been overstated. In their view, the real driving forces are large-scale national planning strategies, massive financial investment, and a tightly managed ecological infrastructure maintained over many years. In addition, several pilot areas have reported unexpected side effects. The buildup of rabbit manure has caused nitrogen levels in the soil to spike, leading to nutrient imbalance. In a few ponds, wetlands, and temporary water bodies, outbreaks of green algae have been observed, raising questions about whether this model can remain stable in the long run, especially if it's expanded into regions with different soil structures. These debates become even more interesting when Kubuchi is compared to one of the world's classic cautionary tales, Australia's rabbit disaster. In the 19th century, just 24 rabbits were brought to the continent for sport hunting, but within less than 50 years, they multiplied into more than a billion. They devastated grasslands, uprooted shrubs, and turned nearly two-thirds of the plains into desert-like barren land. The Australian government tried everything, building a 3,200-kilometer fence, releasing viruses, using explosives, and even carrying out massive extermination campaigns. Yet nothing could stop the rabbit's explosive reproduction. The difference between Australia and China lies in the approach. In Kabuchi, the rabbits are never released into the wild. They are managed within a closed ecological system where every individual is closely monitored and serves a specific purpose, providing natural fertilizer, helping regenerate the soil, and generating economic value for local communities.
Because of this difference in approach, the Kubuchi model gradually began attracting international attention. Although debates about its long-term sustainability still exist, the results have been strong enough to change how the world views land restoration. In 2011, the United Nations officially recognized Kabuki as a global model for land rehabilitation. By 2019, the region was selected as an international demonstration center for anti-desertification solutions. Since then, Wang's methods have started spreading to regions struggling with severe dryness and land degradation, including parts of Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. One of the most notable examples is Andalusia in Spain, the largest semi-arid area in Europe. There, local authorities have begun testing their own Kubuki-style approach, featuring Mediterranean green walls, native plant restoration, regenerative agriculture, and solar farms integrated with agricultural production. Kubuki reminds us that even places once thought dead can come back to life when people are brave enough to push past their limits. It's not just a story of sand turning green. It's proof that the future of our planet isn't shaped by circumstance, but by those willing to act. When humans and nature find their rhythm again, the impossible becomes possible. If you want to explore more stories of restoration and remarkable engineering, don't forget to follow Mandarin Tech.